بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله زاد المستقنع في اختصار المقنع للإمام الحجاوي The author, he's come to the statement pertaining to other conditions of the prayer where he says وَمِنْهَا اجْتِنَابُ النَّجَاسَاتِ And from the conditions pertaining to the prayer is that one must avoid the impurities. One must avoid impurities. Where must the impurities be avoided? We mentioned this, I believe, in the previous lesson. Where must they be avoided pertaining to the prayer? In the clothes, in the place, in the body. Athiyab, which is the clothing, al makan, which is the place, or al-buqa, and al-badan. Okay? So najasa has to be removed before you enter into the salah. It has to be removed, right? And if it comes upon you during the salah, then you have to try to remove it if that doesn't encounter too many movements. Tayyib. With regards to najasa outside of the salah, it's not obligatory upon you to remove it, as mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al -Shawair. So, if somebody went to sleep in clothing which was impure, it was najas, then there's no sin upon that person. Though it's highly recommended to avoid, but there's no sin upon the person, okay? The najasa of the makan that we are trying to avoid is pertaining to where you are standing, where you're going to uh, prostrate your head and your hands. What do I mean by this? So if you're in a place where najasa is all around you, that which you have to avoid is literally where your body is going to touch in the salah. Okay? So when you go into sujood, that which is between your head and your knees is not touching the floor, right? So that najasa which is there is not obligatory for you to remove, though it's highly recommended. What's obligatory for you to remove, if you're able to do so, is that which is going to touch your body and your clothes. Right? The rest of the impurities is not obligatory upon you. Though it would be makru uh, if you're able to remove it and you didn't do so. The author, he says, فَمَنْ حَمَلَ نَجَاسَةً لَا يُعْفَى عَنْهَا I've looked at the translation and uh, sometimes you find that the translations are a bit strange. Because what people do, they translate literally. They don't translate according to the context of what the scholar is speaking about. So that's why sometimes you get a bit of a strange translation. But alhamdulillah, it's a very workable translation, especially if you pay attention to what I say. The Sheikh, the author, he's saying, whoever carries impurities from those which are not overlooked. The impurities from those which are not overlooked. Or the najasa, the impurity, touches his clothing. Or badnihi, or his body. Lam tasihha salatuhu. Then his prayer is not going to be valid, right? So one of the things he mentioned here is that if the impurities are carried from those which are not overlooked. Give me an example of impurities that are overlooked. Ascent. Urine from the female infant which wouldn't be considered from the male infant, from the male infant, okay? What else? A little bit of blood, a little bit of pus and vomit, and athar al the athar, the, that which is left over after istijmar, okay? The athar, we said that once you remove from istijmar and istinja, that, that which is left over is athar, that is also overlooked for you. So these things are, in, not what the author is talking about. So he's saying that if you were to carry najasa, then this is going to inval invalidate your salah. So for example, if somebody in their pocket, they were carrying a container of blood, according to the madhab and these ulama, then your salah will be invalid. If you're carrying a child, your salah can be invalid. How? The child has what? The child has soiled his nappy, right? And it hasn't been changed. So in these situations, this is what the author is talking about. So whoever carries impurity from that which is not overlooked, then that will invalidate his prayer if he knows that he is doing this. The author, he says, If you have a ground which is impure, but then on top of it, clay is put, on top of this impure 
uh, ground, right? The impurity. Or he puts on top of it a carpet of some sort, okay? A thick carpet. Then in these situations, it's disliked, but it's valid, meaning the prayer. So the ground has a lot of najasa on it, right? So you put clay over the najasa or something of that effect. Or you put a thick carpet, a plastic sheet or something, right, over it. Then in this situation, it's disliked, but your salah is valid. Why is it disliked? It's disliked because of the fact that you are praying on top of an najasa. You're literally praying on something which is pure, which is the carpet and the clay, but underneath there is impurity, right? So it's disliked due to that, and it's disliked also due to what we mentioned previously in Kitab al-Tahara, that the humbly scholars, many a time when there was a valid difference, a strong difference in other madhahib, or even within the madhab itself, they would lean towards holding the ruling that this is makru. Let's try and stay away from it if possible, by virtue of the fact that there's a real difference of opinion on the matter. So this is what they're saying, it's makru. So what did he say? He said, you can pray on top of najasa if you have covered it, basically. Covered it with something which doesn't allow the najasa to seep through, to come through, right? Then it's not a problem. وَإِنْ كَانَتْ بِطَرَفِ مُصَلَّى مُتَصِلٍ صَحَّتْ And if it's at the edge of the thing that you are praying on, right? And it's connected to it, then your prayer is still valid. For example, you have, a, you have a carpet which is covering the najasa, but on that najasa, on the edges, the najasa has come to it. He's saying that your prayer is still going to be valid. Why? Obviously, because you're not touching it. Right? It's not touching you. So, your prayer will be valid. However, it's still makru by the virtue of the fact that there's impurity there. In lam yan jarra bi mashihi. In lam yan jarra bi mashihi. Here he's giving another situation. What does the translation say there? Because I remember it being a bit strange. Can somebody read it out loudly? Yeah, step on it and spread it, right? So no, in lam yan jarra bi mashihi. The scholars they mentioned that what this is talking about is that the impurity is not carried by the person. And what they mean by this, say for example, you have something tied to you, right? You have a container which is tied to you. It's not literally with you. Or let me give a clear example. Say you have, for example, a dog on a lead. The dog is impure, right? You're not carrying it, but because he's moving with you as you move, it's considered as though you are carrying it. This is the ruling. This is what they mean by this phrase here. In lam yanjar bimashihi. Okay, if it's not moved with your moving, this is what they mean. So the example given was the example of a dog or like a, a impurity which is tied to you for whatever reason. And if you moved and it moves with you, then this is not allowed. It's considered as though you are carrying an impurity. وَمَنْ رَأَى عَلَيْهِ نَجَاسَ بَعْدَ صَلَاتِهِ وَجَهِلَ كَوْنَهَا فِيهَا لَمْ يُعِدْ لَمْ يُعِدْ So a person, he sees that he has impurity on his clothing. But when does he see this? He sees it after his prayer. And he didn't know that he had it during the prayer. In this situation, okay, his prayer is valid. Why? Because Sheikh Hassan al-Da'ila, in his explanation, he said there's no tafrit here. There's no carelessness, there's no negligence on the person's part. The person just didn't know. Okay? The person didn't know until after the salah. Right? Who can remember from two weeks ago one of the proofs pertaining to this? Of the Prophet وسلم, collected by Ahmad and Abi Dawood. Ahsant, when the Prophet وسلم, took off his shoes and he said, and then the companions took off their shoes. And he said, He said, why did you take off your shoes? They said, We saw you take off your shoes. So we took off our shoes. He said, Inna Jabil atani fa'akbarani anna fihima qadr. The pro, uh, Jabil alayhi salam came to me and told me that underneath them was some filth. But the proof from this hadith is that the Prophet sallallahu didn't know about it. And when he was told about it, he removed it. And therefore, he could continue with his prayer. His prayer wasn't invalid because of the fact that he didn't know about it. Likewise, the author is saying. So the person doesn't know about the impurity which he finds on his clothes until after the salah. So in this situation, it's overlooked. 
طيب the author he says al hajawi wa in alima annaha kanat fiha however if he knows he knew that there was impurity on his clothing right lakin nasiha but he forgot during the prayer he prayed with impure clothing and he knew before that the clothing was impure but he forgot to remove it he forgot to remove the clothing or he forgot to remove the impurity aw jahilaha aad or the person was ignorant of it then he has to repeat the prayer in this situation shaykh hasan al he said here there is tafrit in the first situation there was no tafrit no carelessness or negligence but here in this situation there is carelessness tafrit and negligence and also uh, Shaykh Khalid al mushayqih he says about this word aw jahilaha or he was ignorant of it it could mean one of its real meanings is that the person he saw something on his clothing but he didn't know the ruling of that he wasn't sure was it an impurity or not an impurity but there he saw clearly something on his clothing and he came to realize after the prayer that yes it was an impurity so this is also included in this meaning here Okay, so the first situation is overlooked because the person didn't know about it. This situation is not overlooked because the person did know about it before the prayer, but then he forgot or he was unaware of the actual ruling pertaining to that um, impurity. Tayyib. And Shaykh Mutlaq Jasr in his explanation, he said it's like tahara for the salah. It's like the need for having wudu or ghusl. Right? It's not overlooked due to forgetfulness or due to jahl, things like this. So it has to be there. Another riwayah in the madhab held by Ibn Taymiyyah, his grandfather, Ibn Qadama and others, they say that in these situations, all of them, the, uh, the issue is overlooked. Okay? This is another riwayah held by some of the imams of the madhab. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, وَمَنْ جَبَرَ عَظَمَهُ بِنَجَسٍ لَمْ يَجِبْ قَلْعُهُ مَعَ الضَّرَرِ Whoever fixes a broken part of his body, Okay, with impurity, then he doesn't have to remove that if that's going to harm him. So for example, La Samaha Allah, may Allah not permit a human being, a person, a Muslim, he's broken his arm. And in that place, they get the bone of an impure animal, of a dead animal, for example, and they connect it to his bone, okay, to fix it. In this situation, if it's going to harm and it will harm in this situation, to remove it, then the author is saying then he doesn't have to remove it but if it was something which doesn't harm the person something was used to cure him which is impure like say for example the intestines of the pig is used to sew up a wound or something of that nature then that threading from the intestines of the pig would have to be removed if it won't harm the person right so the the author is saying that no impurity can be used on the body to heal unless there's darr if there's harm then we allow that to take place Harm in the sense that if we were to remove it, the body would be caused harm, we allow that to remain there. Shaykh Khalid al mushayqih he says in the situation of the person who's been given a bone which is impure from a dead animal, he said if the skin grows over the bone, the person's skin grows over the bone, then the person makes wudu as per normal. If the skin doesn't grow over the bone, then when you get to that part, you have to make tayammam for it. Okay? You have to make tayammam for it. The author he says, وَمَا سَقَطَ مِنْهُ مِنْ عُدْوٍ أَوْ سِنٍ فطاهر. That which is falls from a person, could be a tooth, it could be in your battle, your nose comes off, لا سمح الله, like it did to one of the famous companions, and then he was told by the Prophet ﷺ to replace it with a silver nose, the silver didn't work, then it was replaced with a gold nose, okay? So these things can happen. If something is, um, what's the word? If something is apart from the body, falls or is taken off, amputated or anything of that nature, and then it wants to be reconnected, okay? Then you are allowed to do so. Because what did he say here? He said, ما سقط منه من أو سن فطاهر. That which comes off from the body of the human being is considered as pure. If it wasn't pure, you couldn't put it back, okay? And where did they get this from? They got this from that the Prophet ﷺ said, ما أبين من حي فهو كميتاتي. That which is taken from a living animal, then it will have the ruling of what is the situation of the animal, animal when it's dead. Okay, remember we took this in Kitab Tahara, right? So if the animal is considered when it's dead as being impure, then that which is taken from it whilst alive, 
will also be impure. Because the hadith said, مَا أُبِينَ مِنْ حَيٍّ فَهُوَ كَمَيْتَتِهِ That which is taken from the living being whilst it's alive will have the ruling of that when it is dead. So if the animal is considered impure when it's dead, then that which comes from it whilst it's alive will be considered impure. Now how is this a proof for what the author is saying? The author is saying to us that that which comes off from the human being is not going to be considered as impure. How is this a proof? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna al-mu'min or inna al-Muslim la yanjus hayyin wa la mayyit," that the believer doesn't become impure whether alive or dead, right? So going back to the rule, we said that which is removed from the living being would be given the ruling of what it is when it is dead. So the believer in his death is still pure. So that which is removed from the believer is still considered as being pure. Tayyib, that is the wajhul dalala. Wajhul dalala means that is the way of extrapolating the evidence. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, وَلَا تَصَحُّ صَلَاةُ فِي مَقْبَرَةٌ And it's not permitted to pray in a graveyard. Abi Dawood, Abi Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Hibban, and authenticated by Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimullah Ta'ala, quote the hadith with the Prophet وسلم, said from Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, رضي الله عنه, الأرض كلها مسجد. إِلَّا الْمَقْبَرَ والحمام. That the earth, all of it, is considered as a place of, place of prayer. Except for the graveyard and except for the bathroom where you relieve yourself, right? We find that pertaining to the graveyards, so many of the sons of Adam, they fall into fitna of shirk and innovations pertaining to the graveyards. But if people look into the sunnah and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, they will know that the graveyard is not more than a place of burial and a place of remembrance of what is to come to all of us. It's not a place of celebrating. It's not a place of venerating. It's not a place where you go do acts of worship which the Prophet ﷺ did not do. And so many of the ummah have fallen into different types of shirk and innovation. So we find that the Prophet ﷺ told us that do not take my qabr as an Eid. Don't take my grave as an Eid, something which is celebrated or visited time after time, right? So what pertains to the graveyards is something where the Prophet ﷺ said, prayer cannot be there, as the author, he said. Exception is the Janazah prayer. And the exception is the Janazah prayer, as mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al He said one of the reasons, not only that the Prophet ﷺ did it there, but he said if you look at the Janazah prayer, it's all about shifa and dua. It's all about intercession and dua for the dead. So that is not withheld from the dead. That is the right of the dead. So it's not a normal prayer. There's no sujood and ruku there. Okay? It's all in reality a dua and intercession for the dead. So that is an exception there. Sheikh Mutlaq uh, Jasr, Hafidahullah, he said it's considered a graveyard. When is it considered a graveyard? If you have more than two graves in it. Why? Because he said Aisha radiallahu anha in her house, the Prophet ﷺ was buried, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was buried, and she would pray there. Okay? So it's not considered a graveyard until two or more uh, graves are there according to this opinion. Also, where you cannot pray, the next thing the author mentions, he mentions what hush. Hush is what we call today hammam, bathrooms. Okay? Hush is the bathroom, the place of relieving yourself. So what they're saying, what he's saying, Sheikh Mutal Jasr, he said that the, when it's considered a graveyard where you cannot pray, where there's more than two bodies, okay, more than two graves, that's when it's considered as a graveyard, maqbara. Two is fine according to that opinion. But some of the ulama, like Sheikh Abdul Salam al they're very severe in it, they say even one. They say even one. In all cases, it's better to avoid, without a doubt. Aisha radiallahu anha, and they have other explanations for that. Tayyib. Wa hush. What did we say? Hush was the place of relieving yourself, right? What do you do before you go to the bathroom to relieve yourself? You make a dua saying what? You don't have to tell me the words, but what are you asking for? You're seeking refuge from evil devils, right? And any type of evil. So then why would you pray in a place where there's evil and devils, right? And also of, due to the impurities that are there. Also, the author, he says, Hammam. Hammam is the places where you have the saunas, the hot water baths, etc. Also these places because people are uncovered and there could be impurities there also and devils. 
وَعَطَانِ الْإِبْلِ وَعَطَانِ Ibn and the places where the camels are kept. Abu Dawood and Ahmed and Imam Nawi said it's authentic. The hadith of Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhu, where the Prophet was asked, Su'ila an salah fi mabarik al ibn. The Prophet was asked, Can we pray in mabarik al ibn? Those places with the, the stables of the camels. I think it's called camel pen, not camel stable, right? The Prophet said, لا تصلوا في مبارك الإبل فإنها من الشياطين Don't pray where the camels are kept for verily they are from the devils. They are from the shayateen. Then the Prophet was asked, الصلاة في مرابض الغلم In the sheep pen. The Prophet said, صلوا فيها فإنها بركة In these places, pray because verily found there is بركة Blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the hadith is clearly telling us with regards to where the Camels are kept, meaning kept in the sense of sleeping, not kept in the sense where they gather to drink, where they actually are kept to stay overnight, etc., or for a long period of time. These places you cannot pray there. Number one, it was mentioned in the hadith that it's to do with the shayateen. What could be another illa? What could be another reason? Ahsant, barakallahu feek. They're very erratic in their behavior, right? And they hold grudges. So if you've done something wrong to them while you're making sujood, they're going to come and headbutt you or do something to you, right? So it's not good to pray in those areas. وَمَغْصُوب The author, he mentions also, we shouldn't pray or it's not allowed to pray in Dar al maqsub in a place which is stolen. Why? Going back to the ruling that we mentioned before, right? If the prohibition is connected to the act of worship, then it means that the act of worship is going to be forbidden. So they say, how can you do something which is haram with something which is pleasing to Allah together? It's not allowed, right? But some of the ulama of the madhab and Abu Hanif and others and Malik, they say it's permissible. Okay? Uh, so another narration of Imam Ahmad, they say it's permissible to pray in a stolen land because they say, Al-Jahatu Munfakka. They are two separate issues. They say the prayer is one thing and the land itself is a separate thing. You'll be sinful for praying in the stolen land, okay? But it's not directly connected to the prayer itself as a condition. This is the, uh, the second opinion. Also forbidden, but the author he didn't mention is Qari'atul Tariq. Qari'atul Tariq is that path which is habitually used. So if you pray in a pathway which people are using to walk in or cars are using etc and you block the roads and you pray there it's it's uh, forbidden in the madhab unless there is a need okay so you can imagine what crazy people do in london and other places eat time we just block up the roads and don't let people pass it's it's not permissible according to the madhab other scholars allow it but probably if you think about it they're allowing it in muslim countries but we shouldn't do it in non-muslim countries from uh, from dawah etc we don't want to show ourselves as being people who cause chaos, right? And also, other places which is not permissible to pray is Al-Mazbala. Mazbala is like the rubbish tip, the rubbish dump, okay? And Al-Majzara. Majzara is the place, slaughterhouse, where the animals are being slaughtered, etc. So this is also added. The, the author, he didn't mention these three, Qari'at al-Tariq, the pathway which is used. Mazbala, the rubbish tip or the rubbish dump, and Majzara, that place where the animals are slaughtered. Slaughtered. So he says now, وَأَسْطُحَتِهَا And also, the roofs, the roofs of these places are not allowed to be prayed on. Why? Because there is a rule, they say, الْحَوَاء تَابِعٌ لِلْقَرَارِ الْحَوَاء تَابِعٌ لِلْقَرَارِ That the air takes the ruling of the ground. The air, that which is above, takes the ruling of that which is below. So for example, as Sheikh Mutal Jasa said, he said, if it wasn't for this rule, you wouldn't be able to make tawaf on the higher floors of the Haram, right? Because there's no Kaaba that you're going around. But because the air, the higher, takes the, the ruling of the ground, due to that, you're allowed to do so. So using that rule here, uh, on what the author is saying, he's saying that you cannot pray on, this, on the roofs, okay, of these places. Due to that rule, and al hawa'u and al hawa'a tabi'un lil qarar. What's an exception to this rule? The author is saying that you cannot pray on these places. You cannot pray on all of the places that we mentioned where you cannot pray. He's saying that now you cannot pray on the roofs of them. What's the exception here? Can you think of an exception? 
Possible. Nowhere else, right? Possible. Close. Close. You're, you're thinking right. Say again, please. No, so we're saying here, the author has forbidden these seven or so places to pray in, right? But now he's saying, he's saying also, and on the roofs of these forbidden places, you cannot pray. But I'm saying to you, there may be a possible exception. And the brother there was close at the back. He, It's a completely different intention altogether. It's not connected to what's going on underneath. So you could have a slaughterhouse, and like the brother mentioned, you can have on top, you can have a masjid, right? Because it's a complete separate um, intention altogether, separate purpose. It's not the same purpose of what is going on underneath. It could be that, for example, you have offices, an office block on top of the slaughterhouse, right? So therefore, in that situation, you can pray. And that was mentioned by Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr in his explanation. Sorry, Sheikh Abdul Salam al Shawayr, in his explanation. So, these places that he mentioned that you cannot pray in them or on them, according to his opinion, he's saying now that you can pray towards it. So, it happens to be wherever you've stopped to pray, that in front of you is a slaughterhouse, in front of you is one of these places where you are forbidden to pray, then you're allowed to pray towards it. Not in it, but towards it, right? So these places, you can pray towards them, but it's makru. However, praying towards the grave is forbidden. You cannot pray towards the grave unless there's a barrier there. And many scholars say not only a barrier, but a pathway, a barrier, then a pathway, then the grave, the graveyard, okay? So the other places, the author is saying you can pray towards them, but it's makru. The grave, you cannot pray towards it, okay? Unless there's a barrier there. If you put a barrier there, then it's still it's makru but permissible. But without the barrier, it's haram to pray towards the grave. Okay? And this is the opinion of Ibn Qudama and Majd ibn Taymiyyah. When they say Majd, they mean the grandfather of Ibn Taymiyyah and also of Ibn Taymiyyah. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, لا تصلوا إلى القبور ولا تجلسوا عليها Don't pray towards the graves and do not sit on them. Okay? So don't pray towards the graves and do not sit on them. The author, he says, وَلَا تَصَحُوا الْفَرِيدَةُ فِي الْكَعْبَةِ It's not permitted to pray an obligatory prayer inside the Kaaba. وَلَا فَوْقَهَا Why not can you pray an obligatory prayer inside the Kaaba? وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرًا And wherever you are in the world, Allah says to us, then face towards the Qibla, the Kaaba. If you're inside the Kaaba, are you facing the Qibla? You're not facing the Qibla, you're missing much of it, right? So due to this verse and other evidences, you cannot pray a fard prayer inside the Kaaba. Okay? So Allah is commanding us in the verse to face wherever you are in the world, face towards the Qibla. So the author's understanding and others is that if you are praying inside the Kaaba, you're not facing the Qibla. Right? You're not facing the Qibla. The the, the exactly. The the Say again, please. That, that's the difference here, that whether it's or nafil. Yes, I was about to mention that the Nafil, Barakallah Feek, the Nafil is an exception, right? With the, regards to the Nafil, there's takhfif in ruling. There's ease in the ruling. Because one, the Prophet ﷺ prayed Nafil inside the Kaaba. And number two, there's with regards to nafil, is not as strict in facing the qibla as it is with the fard. Tayyib. So that's an exception. Uh, with regards to, we said not allowed to pray on top of the Kaaba either, right? We said you cannot pray the obligatory prayer in the Kaaba, nor on top of the Kaaba. The Prophet Sallallahu in the books of Sunan, like Abi Dawood, etc. Naha Rasulullah Sallallahu Salaam ala dhahri al-Kaaba. The Prophet Sallallahu forbade that one prays on top of the Kaaba, right? One of the reasons mentioned by the ulama, like Sheikh Mutlaq al Jasa, they said, What do you think one of the reasons is when you're on top of the Kaaba? Same to the reason as being inside it, right? You're not facing the Qibla. Some of it will be behind your back. Depends whereabouts you're standing, right? Unless you're standing right on the edge of the Kaaba. 
then you can say possibly that you can pray there because then it's in front of you, right? So the ulama, they say not to pray on top of the Kaaba either. The nafil prayer can be prayed inside the Kaaba if there's a shakhis. Shakhis means there's something of height that you can face from the Kaaba, okay? So what they mean here, for example, if the door is open of the Kaaba and the person is praying in nafil there and he's not facing anything, okay, from the Kaaba, then his salah is invalid. Because you can imagine the Kaaba door is open and he's praying there, facing, looking out. He's not facing anything of the Kaaba. Whereas if one part of the door was closed, he's still facing something which is connected to the Kaaba. So in this situation, it's permissible uh, with regards to Nafal. With regards to Nafal, right? Sheikh Khalid al Mushaykh, he says that the f- famous opinion in the Madhab is that you can pray, okay, the Nafal even if you are not facing a Shakhis. We said the shakhis is something connected to the Kaaba of height. Why did they say this? They said because the important thing is the buqa, the, the earth itself, the earth of the Kaaba, the ground of the Kaaba, the place of the Kaaba. That's what is required. So for example, if there comes a time which they will when the Kaaba is destroyed, where are people going to pray? They can't face it. But they will still face towards the foundations, right? The earth of the Kaaba. That is what is uh, imperative according to this opinion mentioned by Sheikh Khalid al-Mushaykh and it's the mashhur opinion of the madhab, Allah knows best. وَمِنْهَا from the conditions of the salah is istiqbal al-qibla the next condition that the author is going on to talk about now is actually facing the qibla conditions pertaining to facing the qibla, right? So as Allah says in the Quran وَمِنْ حَيْثُ, ومن حيث كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وَجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَهُ and wherever you are, then face towards the Qibla. Wherever you are, then face towards the Qibla. So this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you think about this command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's pretty amazing. Wherever you are in any time zone of the day, as you know, the time zone changes, right, every so often, but you have millions of people responding to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facing the Qibla. And it's really quite amazing when you think about it. That look at the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That nothing else, no other creation can compare to that. Who else is obeyed the way Allah azawajal is obeyed? It shows you the izzah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which he deserves. That millions upon millions of people are facing the Kaaba. So he says, فَلَا تَصِحُّوا بِدُونِهِ إِلَّا لِعَاجِزٍ You cannot pray an obligatory prayer without facing the Qibla except for the one who is unable. The one who is unable, because they have the rule in fiqh, they say, لا واجب ما لا عجز. There's no obligation with inability. ولا محرم ما لا اقترار. And there's nothing forbidden in the situation of being compelled. Okay? لا واجب ما لا عجز. There's no obligatory, there's no obligation with inability. ولا محرم ما لا اقترار. And there's no haram in the situation of being compelled. So here a person is unable to face the Kaaba, then that shart is removed from him. Give me an example of somebody praying but unable to face the Kaaba. Huh? Aeroplane wouldn't be correct. Why? Be- the previous rule I gave you, an al hawa'u and al hawa'a tabi only al qarar, that the air will take the same ruling as the ground. So if you face the Kaaba on the ground. It's, you still have to face it above in the air. It has the same ruling. Somebody wants to give a... A blind person, of course. The blind person can't face the Kaaba unless someone guides him to it, right? So he's uh, excused. Somebody who's sick, paralyzed, unable to move, la Allah, unless somebody moves him. Somebody who's being chased by enemy and he needs to pray. You can pray Salat al-Khawf, right? So he doesn't need to face the Kaaba. So in these situations, right? Uh... وَمُتَنَفِّلٍ رَاكِبٍ سَائِرٍ فِي سَفَرٍ He says, and also the one who's praying nafal, whilst riding and whilst travelling on a journey. So, four things. Four qoyud. He's praying a nafal salah. He's on a riding beast or on a car. In a car, not on a car. Right? And he's actually on the journey, moving. Okay? These are the four things. In Bukhari Muslim, it's narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. Who said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يسبح على راحلته قبل أي, أي وجه توجه 
The Prophet ﷺ used to pray on his camel or his riding beast in any direction that it used to be going. Okay? وَيُوتِرُ عَلَيْهَا And he used to make witr upon it also. غَيْرَ أَنَّهُ لَا يُصَلِّ عَلَيْهَا الْمَكْتُوبَ Except that he never used to pray any obligatory prayers upon the riding beast. So here's a clear proof that when you're on a journey and you're riding something, whether it be a beast or a car, okay, then you do not need to face the qibla. But there's an exception here. He'll say to us, وَيَلْزَمُهُ إِفْتِتَحُ الصَّلَاءِ إِلَيْهَا But the beginning of the, of the prayer has to be facing the qibla. And then wherever you go in any direction. So before you start driving your car, you face the qibla. This is for the nafal prayer, right? You face the qibla and then you carry on on your journey. That's allowed. As long as you face the qibla when you make takbirat al-ihram. Then you carry on wherever you're going, okay? For the nafal only. For the fard, we have to face the qibla throughout the salah. Unless, unless there's an emergency situation, right? Here we talk about the nafal. So we said the four qayyud. You're on a journey, you're riding, okay? You're actually moving. And what was the one before that? It's a nafal. And it's a nafal. Ahsant. No, because the hadith mentioned that we mentioned that he would never pray fard. Okay, but he mentioned that he would pray witr upon it and he would pray uh, his other nafal prayers uh, on the camel or on the riding beast. Tayyib. So some of the ulama, they said also if it's easy, Shaykh Abdul Salam al he mentioned if it's easy for the person to get down from his beast and to make sujood and ruku, then he should do that facing the qibla, if it's easy, right? Another person who also has this ruling is... Wamashin, the one who is walking, the pedestrian, who is walking on the long journey, on the journey. This person can also start his prayer by facing the qibla, then can go in any direction that he wants, the nafal prayer. Okay? He faces the qibla whilst he's walking on the journey, and then he goes in any direction that he wants. The author says that, of course, he must face the qibla in the beginning, takbiratul ihram. And also when he's doing ruku and sujood. Why did the author say this? Because in his opinion, it's something which is easier to do. It's something which is easy to do. The person's walking, he can make ruku and sujood easily, facing the qibla, and then carry on in any direction that he wants. The author, he says, وَفَرْضُ مَنْ قَرُبَ مِنَ الْقِبْلَ إِصَابَةُ عَيْنِهَا وَمَنْ بَعُدَ جِهَتِهَا Whoever is close to the qibla and can see it, then what's obligatory upon him? That he has to face his body completely in line with the Qibla, in line with the Kaaba. It cannot be that he's facing only part of the Kaaba. Okay? Like some people mistake in the Masjid al-Haram. They don't ensure that they are facing the Qibla. Okay? They're slightly off for whatever reason. If you're close to it, you have to ensure and you can see it, you have to ensure that you are facing it. However, if there's a barrier between you or you are at a distance, then you have to face the direction of the Kaaba. Not exactly why, because in Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said to the people of Medina, مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقْ وَالْمَغْرِبْ قِبْلَ Okay? That which is between the east and the west is Qibla. Okay? So of course in other situations, other points of location will be your Qibla, right? Depending where you are. So the Prophet ﷺ said that which is between the east and the west is Qibla. Um, Bismillah. Imam Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, he said this is ijma, ijma that the person doesn't have to face the qibla if he's at a distance. Ijma, okay? It's something which is agreed upon. And also, Shaykh Abdul Salam al Shawayr, he said even if the person intentionally turns away from the qibla, not fully, slightly, yanharif an al qibla, right? The qibla he knows is that direction, but for whatever reason he turns slightly away from it, even this prayer for him is valid. Why? Because what's imperative is that he, makes, he faces the general direction. This is the person who's far away. The person who's close has to face it exactly. And the one who can see it. The one who cannot see it, and the one who is at a distance, doesn't have to face it exactly. Has to face the direction. So we say to all those masjid committees that are always fighting with each other about the direction, it's okay, right? As long as you're in the general direction of it, and you don't have the ability to find the exact with certain tools, uh, certain technology, then leave it alone. Don't argue. فَإِنْ أَخْبَرَهُ ثِقَّةٌ بِيَقِينٌ The author says, if somebody notifies him, gives him information, and this person has certainty about the information which he's giving. So somebody doesn't know where the Qibla is, but somebody comes to him and tells him where the Qibla is based upon certainty, whether it's male or female. 
Females, you may want to think twice, right? Depending on the mood. But if it's a male or female, but they have certainty, then you have to take what they're saying. Then that for you is information that you have to act upon. Or وَجَدَ مَحَارِبَ إِسْلَامِيَةً عَمِلَ بِهَا Or the person finds the mihrab. This is the mihrab, right? The space which is built in the masjid, pointing in the direction of the qibla. So if a person sees the mihrab either from the outside of the masjid or the inside, then of course he knows that the qibla is in that direction. Because Muslims have always tried to build the mihrab, maharib, in the direction of the qibla. The mihrab which is not allowed, is disliked in Islam, is the one where if the imam enters it, you can't see him. If there's that type of mihrab, then that is the one which is disliked and not allowed, right? The author, he says, وَيُسْتَدَلُّ عَلَيْهَا فِي سَفَرْ بِالْقُطْبِ and the person, if he's traveling, then he should try to determine where the Qibla is by the North Star, the Qutb, the North Star. Those who know how to determine by the North Star, they can tell you by locating that star in the sky where the Qibla is from that, right? وَالشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ وَمَنَازِلِهَا And also the sun and the moon and the rising and setting points of the sun and the moon. By this, there are people that know how to determine the direction of the Qibla. What else can we use? Apart from the North Star, the Sun and the Moon. You can use your compass, right? As long as it's not on a Samsung. Make sure it's iPhone, not Samsung. Right? Tayyib. <laughs> so the author, he says, <laughs> If two mujtahids are on the journey. Mujtahid means people of knowledge who have the ability to deal fully with that issue. The issue of finding the Qibla. They have all the knowledge pertaining to that, right? There's two of them. So if two of them are on the journey with this group, but they both differ, لم يتبع أحدهما الآخر Then neither of them are allowed to follow the other. Why? Because one thinks that it's to the east, one thinks it's to the west, right? Or whatever it be. <laughs> right? So they're not allowed to follow each other because based upon his knowledge, he's sure that it's in a particular direction. So he cannot pray intentionally in a d different direction keeping his friend, who's also a mujtahid, happy. So they each have to pray their own prayer. However, Ibn Qudama in Al-Mughni, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he mentions that if these two, these mujtahids, right, the ones who have the knowledge of how to determine the Qibla, complete knowledge, if they both agree in the general direction that the Qibla is towards the east, for example, but they have differences over whereabouts, the inhiraf, they're turning a little bit to the left or turning a little bit to the right, then this doesn't matter. In this situation, they should pray together. Okay? The author says, The muqallid, the one who doesn't have the ability, doesn't have the knowledge and the means to determine which way the qibla is, then he should follow from these two mujtahids the one who he has most trust in. How do you trust a person in this situation? What does he mean by trust that you have more trust in? What? You trust his honesty, right? What's before honesty? His knowledge. His knowledge, his honesty, right? His knowledge and his honesty. And of course, you don't base it upon he's my friend, so I'm going to go with him and leave this group instead. No, this is pertaining to worship. When it comes to worship, you don't try to please your friends and family. You please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this situation, the muqallid, the one who doesn't have the ability to determine the direction, he follows the one who he feels more certainty in knowledge and trustworthiness. Tayyib. وَمَنْ صَلَّ بِغَيْرِ إِشْتِهَادٍ وَلَا تَقْلِيدٍ قَضَى إِنْ وَجَدَ مَنْ يُقَلِّدُهُ If a person is a muqallid, he doesn't have the ability to determine the qibla. So he doesn't make taqlid. He doesn't follow one of the mujtahid people. Right? He, he, he doesn't follow one of the mujtahid people, nor does he make ishtihad. Because obviously he can't. He doesn't have the ability. <coughs> then in this situation, his prayer is going to be invalid. In wajada man yuqalliduhu. So again, the author is saying if this person doesn't have the ability to make ishtihad, then he, if he prays without asking the mujtahid, right, then his salah would be invalid. Why? Because there was somebody there that could have told him. So if this person he prays, Shaykh Khalid al Mushaykh, he said the person prays. And then after the salah, or he prays and he didn't bother to find out the direction, right? So after the salah, he doesn't know whether his salah is in the right direction. His salah is invalid. 
If a person prays and he finds out that his salah was in the wrong direction, obviously his salah is invalid. If a person prays the third thing and he finds out that his salah was in the correct direction, but this person prayed without asking the mujtahid, nor did he make the effort to go and ask somebody or to find out where the qibla was, again his salah is invalid in all situations. Why? What is this similar to that we had, I believe, last week? Conditions. Yeah, conditions. This is all to do with conditions. The conditions of the timing of the prayers, remember? We said if somebody doesn't bother to find out the timing of the prayers, then his salah, even if he ended up praying in the correct time, then his salah is going to be invalid. Why? Because he didn't make the effort <coughs> to find out. Tayyib. He says, The one who has the knowledge, the mujtahid, the ability to find the direction of the qibla, then he has to do this for every prayer. So he prayed dhuhr in a particular direction after using his knowledge of the, of the star, the north star, the qutb, or the sun and the moon, or other things, even the wind. Some people know by the wind, directional and different type of wind. They can tell the qibla is in that direction. Uh, then if a person prays using all of that knowledge, he prayed dhuhr, but now it's time for asr. Does he say, okay, I'm still going to pray in that direction? The author is saying no. The author is saying he has to start again from the beginning using his knowledge to determine where the qibla is because something may have changed. Something may have changed, right? For him to now think that actually after exerting my knowledge based upon the information I have, I think the qibla is a bit more in that direction, right? So this is why he's saying that the one who has the ability must make ijtihad, must strive again to the best of his knowledge. He says, وَيُصَلِّي بِثَانِي وَلَا يَقْدِي مَا صَلَّى بِالْأَوَّلِ If in this situation, after having prayed dhuhr, he comes to asr, he makes ijtihad again, he exerts his effort and finds out, well, actually, my salah should have been in this direction. Then his first salah is still valid. The ijtihad he made in the first time is still valid. But his second ijtihad, he has to act upon it. Right? So if he had changed from the first to the second, his first salah doesn't need to be made up. Because that was what he had to do and that was what he was able to do in that time. Fattaqullah mastata'atum. Fear Allah as much as you can. Okay? The Allah says. And also, Umar radiallahu anhu, in inheritance, he gave a fatwa to a group of people. And then years later, he gave another fatwa to a group of people, which was different to the first. The first group found out about it and they came to Umar radiallahu anhu saying, Umar, can we benefit from what you've mentioned pertaining to the inheritance that you gave and we distributed on your old fatwa? He said, That is going to remain as the ruling that we gave and this is what we are giving as a ruling now. So the ulama took from this statement of Umar that al ijtihad la yunqad bil ijtihad. That ijtihad is not repealed due to a new ijtihad. Means that the new ijtihad you're going to act upon, but the rulings that were given on the first ijtihad, they are left. They're not going to be changed. Unless there is a clear nas, unless a clear evidence comes. Nas meaning that it doesn't require ijtihad. It's clear like the sun. In that situation, you will change the rulings, right? We'll stop here, inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi wa sallam. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. I ask Allah azawajal to make this heavy in our scale of good deeds. Ameen. If you have any questions to what we took, then feel free.